Good morning and welcome to the virtual worship experience of the New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church of Mott's, Alabama. We wish you a very wonderful, happy, and Holy Palm Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to New Jerusalem. Oh, I be Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our Father, our Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Eternal God, we come to you in the matchless name of Jesus. We come to you, God, because we have no other place to turn but you. You are the supreme ruler of the earth. You are our Alpha and our Omega, our beginning and our end. So, Lord, we come to you on today. We come to you, God, asking for forgiveness of all of our sins and transgressions. We ask, O oh Lord, that you create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in us. Lord, walk with us on this day. Be with us throughout this worship experience. Lord, just touch us right now, God, so that we know that you're still walking by our side. We trust you, O oh God, with everything that we have. We trust you, O oh God, to feed us and to clothe us. Lord, we thank you because you've done it so many times down through the years. And Lord, we can't say thank you enough. Lord, we thank you right now for every blessing and provision. We thank you right now for keeping us through the dangerous times that are going on in our world right now. And Lord, we ask that you continue to keep us, God. Keep us in your care. Encamp your angels around us, O oh God, that we may be safe and free from hurt, harm, and danger. Look after our children, O oh God. You know so many things are going on, God, but if you protect them, O oh God, we know that everything will be all right. Lord, bless New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church. We need you right now, God. As we get ready to prepare to come back to worship, we need you right now, God. We need you to protect each and every member from the coronavirus. We need you to protect each and every member from influenza. We need you to protect each and every member from every disease in the land, God. Just protect us, God. Be our healer right now, God. Heal us of every infirmity right now, God. Heal our bones, God. heal our bodies, heal our minds, heal our spirits, oh God. Because, God, we need you right now. Lord, if you don't do it, we have no other place to turn. So we turn to you, O oh God, because you are our God. You are our Elohim. You are our Yahweh. You are our Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. We love you, God. And Lord, we thank you right now for loving us in return. Lord, we bless your name. We give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we prepare to return to worship, please remember that the coronavirus has not gone away. Please continue to wash your hands and wear your mask. As Women's History Month comes to a close, we want the women of New Jerusalem to know that you are special every day. We salute you for being the extraordinary, phenomenal, and virtuous women that you are. Get ready, get ready, get ready. April 18th is our day when we will reopen and worship together once again. Please wear your mask and come on out to service. 
Today at sundown, our fast comes to a close. However, if you follow the traditional Lent fast and took Sundays off, please continue fasting until April 3rd. May God bless all who joined us on this fast and may God keep you. The Bible commands us to pray for one another. So please keep all of our sick, our shut-in, those that are hospitalized and or in bereavement in your prayers. For those of you who are celebrating birthdays this coming week, happy birthday to you and many more. And now it's time to worship with our children. Good morning, children. It's Minister Loretta. Hey, it's Sydney. Coming to you with today's word. Today's scripture is coming from Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, and chapter 27, verses 21 through 23. Sid, would you read the scriptures for me today, please? The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the highest. Which of those two do you want me to re release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas the answer. What shall I do then? With Jesus who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they all, all they shouted all the louder, crucify him. But today's message is on being loyal to to the team Jesus and uh, what today's word is saying that crowds can be fickle right say do you have a favorite sports team yes who's your favorite team go to state warriors okay how did they do this year not good not that good, not that good. so you wouldn't see it like you usually do huh I yeah would. well my favorite team has always been the Auburn Tigers like you know and you know just like with most teams when your favorite team isn't doing well, then those devoted fans and the crowd doesn't cheer as loud or doesn't celebrate like they used to. And the same thing happened to Jesus. Today's two scriptures are clear examples of how we as Christians can sometimes be fickle too. And we need to be, we can't be fair weather when it comes to our devotion to our Lord and Savior, right? And what, what the scripture is saying that you know, that Sunday, which we're celebrating today on Palm Sunday, it was a, a celebration and they were putting palm branches on the street and laying their cloaks down and, and, uh, and they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blesses he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they were celebrating his, his because they thought he was gonna come in this mighty warrior. And then when uh, a few days later, when he was brought before Pilate, the, the priest and the, the chief officials had convinced the crowd that they should choose a criminal rather than Jesus to release uh, uh, to release a, a criminal rather than Jesus. Did you know that? Yeah. And they people the same people that were honoring him with palm leaves and putting their cloaks on the road were saying, we want Barabbas and crucify him. And they had changed just like, you know, like sports fans do when you start losing. You know, as long as the team is winning and they think you're going to be victorious, they're on board. And as soon as they they feel that uh, the pressure and the team's not doing as well, they, they change their tune or they, they decide that uh, we, we're not supporting like we used to. And and we don't want to be that way in our Christian walk, do we, young people? Do we, Sid? Mm -mm. No, we want to be committed. And what this scripture should remind each of us, and like it reminds me, is that we have a choice each day to make Jesus Lord of our lives and to stay committed despite the circumstances, despite what others say, 
despite the crowd and those, those others like the crowd was was even his friends you know the disciples were afraid to speak up and say this is the messiah and no this is not right nobody stood up they were chanting with the crowd they, not the disciples but the people was chanting give us barabbas and crucify him and barabbas was a criminal but they fell to the victim of the crowd so i encourage you young people to be strong in your faith stand strong in your commitment to the lord and let's make Jesus Lord of our lives each and every day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, sis. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for your son for forgiving us for our sins. Jesus, say we choose to make, your Lord, make you the Lord of our lives. Help us to be strong and foe, even when the others forsake you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week. And let's celebrate this Palm Sunday by recommitting our lives. As we uh, come out of our fast, don't forget to put Jesus first.
as a child Made my mother's Please join me in John chapter 11, the Gospel of John chapter 11, verses 45 through 53. The Gospel of John chapter 11, verses 45 through 53. 
From this passage of scripture, the Bible says, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now, this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. They plotted to put him to death. I want to lift the subject using the question, what if they had succeeded? What if they had succeeded? They, T-H-E-Y is a very familiar group of people known in the African-American church. That's not to say that they aren't found in churches of other ethnicities, but I can only speak about what I know. They can be dangerous, but the identity of they can be compared with that of the members of a secret society because very often no one knows who they is. And for those who are sticklers for grammatical correctness, I use they is instead of they are because they is not plural. They is a single body, a clique, a social group, if you will. They can sanction some stiff opposition to positive things that are trying to happen in the church. They can be seen as a force to be reckoned with for many pastors in an attempt to carry out the vision given to them by God. They is an entity that should not often be addressed, nor should they be ignored. Because more often than not, Addressing they can send things spiraling out of control and cause more damage than just ignoring them. But you can't ignore them completely because they may have some power to discharge underlying currents that will wreak havoc on the prospering and forward momentum of the church. Have I got a witness here? The behind the scenes in the dark group known as they has been around a very, very long time. They is a group of people. Some and others are subcommittees of they. In the gospels, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Many versions say, who do people say that I am? But in essence, what Jesus was asking his disciples is, who do they think I am? His disciples answered by saying, some say and others say. In other words, there were various views of who Jesus was based on the differing opinions of smaller factions of they. Yet, they still had no clue in who he was. It was Peter who had to bring clarity to the situation, professing, thou art the Christ, 
the son of the living God. Do I have any Bible readers out here today? Because if they knew who Jesus was, they would not have tried to stop Easter. They would have embraced him instead of wanting him dead. They would have stood with him instead of washing their hands of him. They would have encouraged him instead of trying to stop him. Have I got a witness in this place? So today I want to ask the question, what if they had gotten what they wanted? What if they had succeeded? First of all, if they had succeeded, there would be no Easter. Today is Palm Sunday, and right now most of us are preparing for Easter next week. Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ and Messiah from the dead. We all have heard and know the story of how one Friday, just outside of the city of Jerusalem, Jesus was marched to the Via Dolorosa and up a hill called Golgotha. He was beaten, spit on, and ridiculed along the way, eventually falling to the ground from his unmerited suffering. That's when they forced Simon of Cyrene, a black man from Libya in Africa, to help Jesus carry his cross. When they arrived at Golgotha, the place of the skull as it was called, they nailed Jesus through his hands and feet onto the wooden cross. Two others who were convicted thieves were also nailed to crosses to be put to death on that day. They were all raised up above the earth and Jesus in the center so that all who were around could see them die. But I can hear Jesus prophetically saying in John 12 and 32, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Have I got a witness in here? So this was God's plan. This was a necessary evil in order for Easter, as we know it, to come into being. There would be no Easter without Jesus dying. It had to happen. Jesus had to die. Yet there were many who tried to stop it. Peter, the hot-headed disciple of Christ, tried to stop it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He drew his sword fiercely opposed to the mob taking Jesus into custody by force. He cut off the ear of Malchus, the servant of Caiaphas, the high priest, only to have Jesus perform yet another miracle by immediately replacing and restoring the man's ear. Ah, oh, my brothers and sisters, he was at that point willing to fight to death to prevent Jesus' death. But Jesus, knowing what had to be done, commanded Peter to put his sword away. He told him, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Making it plain, Jesus was telling Peter, are you going to stop me from my destiny? This is my purpose. This is God's plan for me. Who are you to stop it? Therefore, Jesus was taken marched from Judgment Hall to Judgment Hall, while Peter would follow and deny even knowing him three times. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea also tried to stop the crucifixion of Jesus. They refused to consent to the murderous plot of their fellow Jewish council members. In case you don't remember, Nicodemus is the one who went to Jesus by night. He admitted that they knew that Jesus was a teacher who had come from God. How else could he do everything that he was doing, teach the way he was teaching, and perform the miracles that he was performing? He also asked how he could be born again. Being old, how could he enter his mother's womb a second time? But Jesus told him, very truly I say unto you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. But most importantly, 
It was to Nicodemus that Jesus revealed one of the most beloved Bible verses, which is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall have everlasting life. Then there's another member of the ruling council by the name of Joseph, who was of Arimathea. Joseph is remembered for going to Pilate to secure the body of Jesus for burial. He, like Nicodemus, refused to consent to the death of Jesus. If it were up to these two men who refused to go along to get along, Jesus' life would have been spared and we would have no Easter. But on that Friday, so long ago, Jesus died on Calvary's cross. He was buried in Joseph's new tomb. He went down into the bowels of the earth to preach liberty to the captives. And early one Sunday morning, he arose with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. He had to die, but thank God for the resurrection. It is the resurrection that gives life to Christians. It is the resurrection that solidifies victory over death. It is the resurrection that defeated they. Because if they had been successful, we would have had no Easter to celebrate. Am I right about it? But the second thing that we must understand is that if they had succeeded, there would also be no salvation. Salvation is the term used to convey that someone has been saved from danger or destruction. In the Christian faith, sin is the danger that can lead to destruction. Paul wrote in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But he wasn't talking about a physical death. He was talking about a spiritual one. A spiritual death would leave you stranded when Jesus returns for the saints of God. A spiritual death would leave you looking on the outside in when God's children return to their heavenly home. A spiritual death would leave you trapped inside a fiery pit where the fire is raging hot and will never cease from burning. That's why Satan tried to stop salvation. The Bible records that he tempted Jesus after he was hungry and had been fasting 40 days and nights out in the wilderness. Satan entered the mind of Jesus saying, if you are the son of God, command that these stones be turned to bread. But Jesus responded by saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So then the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple. Remember, this was a mind trip. Many of us know how our minds can mess with us, how Satan will come into our thoughts and try to get us to do things that are unrighteous. He did the same to Jesus. He said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written that he shall give angels charge over you in their hands you shall bear up lest you dash your foot against a stone. But again, Jesus avoided temptation by saying, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So the devil came at him one more time. That's why you have to know that the devil is persistent, brothers and sisters. He will keep trying to catch you with your guard down, but you have to keep your whole armor of God up. The devil again took Jesus in his mind to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Then he told Jesus, I will give you all of this if you only fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him something that many of us say all the time, Satan, get thee behind me. Get away from me, Satan, for it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. Praise the Lord, somebody. Satan couldn't stop Jesus from completing the mission of salvation. He didn't succeed, but we too must fight against the wiles of the devil. We must be ready at every turn and prepare to fight the enemy with the word of God. But sadly, not everyone will be saved. 
In Luke 13, Jesus put it this way when he when asked if there were few who were to be saved. He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. But how many of you know that Jesus is the way to salvation? In Thessalonians 5, 9, the Bible says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. If we are to live with God in the kingdom of heaven, we must find salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. This was only possible because of the sacrifice he made for us. Paul wrote, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. It is because of Christ, our living sacrifice, that we are saved by grace. Is there anybody here today that is glad that grace knows your name? You see, brothers and sisters, while you were still living in sin, grace found you. Grace forgave you of all the mess you were in. Grace protected you from the devil when he tried to take you out. And even now, if it weren't for grace, you wouldn't even qualify for salvation. Have I got a witness in this place? But we must understand, the decision to crucify Jesus was not that of people who were seeking or expecting salvation to the world through Christ. It was the decision of men who wanted to get rid of Jesus for their own selfish gain and ambition. They were afraid that Jesus would ruin their long-standing positions of power and authority over the Jewish people. They were afraid that Jesus would ruin their corrupt relationship with the Roman government. They were afraid that people would turn from Jewish law to follow the professed fulfillment of the law. And they wanted to stop Jesus at all costs. If they had succeeded, there would be no salvation. If they had succeeded in convincing people of the lies that his disciples stole the body, the story of Jesus would have ended where it started over there in the Middle East. If they had succeeded in keeping the body of Jesus sealed in Joseph's tomb, guarded by Roman soldiers assigned by Pilate, there would be no hope of salvation. If they had succeeded in getting people to believe the lies that they spread about Jesus, then Jesus wouldn't have fit the description of a perfect sacrifice. But I'm thankful to God that all of their conniving, all of their deception, and all of their unrighteousness was overcome by the righteousness of God. For early one Sunday morning, somebody ought to say early, the Bible says that a second earthquake struck the countryside of Jerusalem. The first had been at the cross where our Savior bled and died. It was so powerful that it scared those who were a part of the crucifixion. Matthew 27, 54 reports that the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. But the second earthquake reported in Matthew 28 
reveals that there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Therefore, when Mary Magdalene and the other women went to anoint the body, they found an empty tomb. The angel of the Lord told them that Jesus had risen just like he said he would, and they would see him in Galilee, and that they should leave to go tell his disciples. If all those who wanted Jesus to live had succeeded, there would not have been a sacrifice. There would have been no resurrection, and there would have been no salvation. Have I got a witness in this place? But finally, if they had succeeded, we would have no hope. Until the empty tomb was discovered, the mood was somber among the followers of Christ. The disciples had scattered and were afraid of themselves being captured and put to death. The women made a gloomy trek to give the body of Christ a proper Jewish anointing before it was sealed forever in a hollow tomb. Judas Iscariot went and took his own life feeling horribly guilty of his role in convicting an innocent man and Jesus being crucified because of that conviction. Despite what they have been told by Jesus before his death, they were hopeless. Jesus told them that he would be killed and would rise on the third day, but they apparently didn't believe it. He told them that he would be a living sacrifice, but they didn't buy into that. He told them that he would have to leave them to prepare a place for them, but they didn't grasp hold to that. Instead, after his crucifixion, the followers of Christ felt hopeless. They felt defeated. They felt broken. They could not believe that their master and teacher, the Holy One come from God, had been senselessly murdered between two thieves. He had done nothing more than teach God's word, heal the sick, cause the lame to walk, cleanse lepers, forgive sinners, open blind eyes and deaf ears, and feed the hungry. Everything he did was good and very good. His ministry was positive. His actions were godly. How could he have come to this end, they thought. They were hopeless in the midst of hope. But early on a Sunday morning, the flame of hope was reignited. Not only did the women see an angel at the tomb, but Mary Magdalene saw Jesus in the garden. She didn't recognize him at first, probably because of all the teardrops filling up her eyes. She thought he was just the gardener. But how many of you know that the sheep of Jesus know the voice of the shepherd? For the Bible says that Jesus authoritatively called her by name, Mary. He's, she turned towards him, responded, Rabbanai, which is Aramaic for teacher. I can only imagine that her sadness turned to joy. Her hopelessness turned to hopefulness. Her disappointment turned to happiness because she knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus lives. Paul told us not to sorrow like others who have no hope. In other words, we have to have unshakable faith and unrelenting hope. We must have the faith of Abraham who was told to sacrifice his only son. By faith, Abraham followed the plan of God, but his hope delivered a ram in the bush. Have I got a witness here? We must have the faith of Joshua, who was one of two consenting spies who believed that they could succeed on their mission with God on their side. 
By faith, Joshua went into the promised land as a leader, while those who failed to put their hope in God were left beyond. Have I got a witness in this place? We must have the faith of Daniel who was thrown in the lion's den for refusing to stop praying to his God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By faith, the Bible tells me, he entered the den of lions, slept all night long, but his hope brought him out of the den still in one piece. When we put our hope in God, miracles can happen in our everyday lives. Doors can be opened that no man can shut. Our dreams can become our reality and not just some unreachable element of hopelessness. When we have the hope of an Abraham, a Joshua, or a Daniel, we can accomplish anything we set out to do. We realize that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Have I got a witness here? So as I get ready to leave you today, I wonder how many of you have the same kind of hope today? How many of you know that Jesus lives and is not dead? How many of you know that he is still just a prayer call away? How many of you know that he can mend a broken heart? He can restore your sin sick soul. Just keep the faith and remain in hope. I want to leave you with this today. In 1834, Pastor Paul Moat was walking to work when the thought popped in his head to write a hymn on the gracious experience of a Christian. As he walked up the road, he came up with the chorus, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. By the end of that day, it was reported that he had written the first several verses and put them safely in his pocket. Later in the week, while visiting a friend whose wife was very ill, he attempted but could not find a fitting song of comfort to sing to this couple. So he pulled out his newly written lyrics and sang his new song with them. The wife enjoyed them so much that she asked for a copy. Pastor Mo went home to finish the last two verses and sent it off to a publisher. According to the Lutheran hymnal handbook, he said, as these verses so met the dying woman's case, my attention to them was more arrested and I had a thousand printed for distribution. Almost two centuries later, my brothers and sisters, we still sing these words of hope and assurance. It is our de declaration that in the midst of all of the storms of life, we must hold on to God's unchanging hand. The song simply says our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly cling to Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When faced with adversity. Hope should be our battle cry. In the midst of this pandemic, we should have hope. During the senselessness of mass shootings, we should remain hopeful. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, we must have hope that there is still life ahead of us. That's why I'm glad today that they didn't succeed. They didn't succeed in cutting the mission of Jesus. They couldn't succeed in trying to tarnish his name and reputation. They didn't succeed in finding fault in him. They didn't succeed in stopping him from being crucified. They didn't succeed in preventing him from being resurrected from the dead. That's why I still have hope. Because just like they didn't succeed back then, they won't succeed today. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. We can't let anyone or anything extinguish the flames of our hope. God is not a man that he should lie. Every word he has ever said, we can take it to the bank. Hold on to your hope. Just like they couldn't hurt him, they can't hurt you. 
They may talk about you, but they talked about him. They may plot against you, but they plotted against him. They may even resort to lying on you, but they also lied on him. So I would say you're in good company. They did not, they cannot, they will not succeed. For Jesus died and rose again that we might have life more abundantly. May God bless you and may God forever keep you.